All right, let's get started, everybody. So my name's Ahmed. Some of you know me, some of you don't. And today we're going to talk about programming for fun to better perform under pressure, where I try to convince you to do your job in your spare time. <laughs> so pressure is something we all face every day, right? Sometimes it's pressure over deadlines. Sometimes it's pressure over our own performance. Sometimes it's just general uncertainty about the future, right? And it can be difficult to, uh, to perform the way you normally do when you're stressed. It can be hard, and sometimes you just don't have a good time. But sometimes all we really need to get past this pressure is a different perspective, right? Sometimes the pressure we face is just blocking us, and we can't think of anything but the stress until we look at things in a slightly different way, and then suddenly all our problems seem to disappear. Some of you may have experienced this. Maybe you're working on something for a really long time and you like go take a quick lunch break or maybe you sleep on it for a night and you wake up in the morning and you're like, ah, of course, of course that's how it works. Uh, <laughs> the guy's laughing on the people who've done this before. And this is what we call a shift in perspective, right? You've changed your way of thinking and by looking at things in a different way, suddenly something that was big becomes small, something, something that was hard becomes easy and so on and so on. However, it's not always easy to get this different perspective. It's not always just like, oh, I'm just going to look at things differently, and now my problems have all disappeared. No. To truly look at things from different viewpoints, we require something called insight. And what do I mean by insight? Insight is a deep and true knowledge of something, right? It is something that cannot be taught. It can only be learned. So, for example, I have a younger sister, she's about this tall, 16, art student. And I can talk to her all day about programming stuff. I can talk to her about sorting algorithms, for example. I can explain how they work, what makes different sorting algorithms different, where are they useful, why is recursive algorithms like merge sort super, super elegant, at least in my opinion. But without the insight that I have working with these things, she wouldn't really get it, right? She'd know of it, but she wouldn't really understand. And thus, she couldn't look at it with a different perspective. So insight is just a level of understanding beyond simply knowing of something, but truly knowing what it is. But where do we, where do we get this insight from, right? It's this magical stuff that gives us perspective. Where do we get it from? We get it from experience, right? We gain our insight through our experiences of the past and things that we've worked with before. So in my case, uh, when I was in school and university, I had to implement a bunch of these sorting algorithms from scratch. I've had to utilize a bunch of them and in many different problems. And so this experience is what allowed me to gain the insight that I needed into these algorithms. And that insight gave me a new perspective. And this has helped me a couple times. There was one time I had something that I needed to sort in under, I believe it was under 200 milliseconds. It was a really long list, some competitive programming thing. I swapped to a different sorting algorithm and everything worked fine because I had that insight and I had a change of perspective. But experience, as much as we want experience in different things, it's a bit difficult to obtain, right? I can't just go down to my local checkers or Woolworths or whatever and grab a bag of experience, no. It takes time, it takes effort, and it requires us to go out of our comfort zone. It requires us to take risks and try new things. But taking risks by nature is scary. No one likes to do it. Unless you do, uh, you do you, I don't like to do it. Uh, and this can be a bit of a tough, a tough pill to swallow, to be like, okay, I need to take risks to get better. And all this means that getting useful and meaningful experience can be a bit challenging. So the main place we get experience from is our day-to-day -day jobs, right? We do things and we learn from them. But you can't always get the experience you need from your day-to-day -day job. So for example, I'm a front-end developer. And if I really wanted to learn a bit more about DevOps, I can't really do it in my day job because one, I needed to work on the front-end. Two, if they let me touch the back-end and the DevOps stuff, I'd probably muck it all up. Uh, and we don't want that. So sometimes you're under a tight deadline and you need to get things done in a fast, reliable way. 
sometimes the project is something that's really critical and you cannot afford to mess it up by trying out new things. And yeah, sometimes you're just pigeonholed into a role like I am sometimes. Or sometimes the project is just a really boring one. It's been around a really long time. All you're really doing is maintenance. And there's no room for innovation or learning new things. I'm looking at you developers who are still working in Java 8. It's time to move on. <laughs> but also, we want a wide base of experience. So one of the problems with, the, with getting experience from work is that we tend to work on one or two things. But the, more, the wider the experiences we get, the more insights we get from these experiences. So naturally, we want a lot of them. And the more different the insights, the more different the perspective we get, and the more depth we can see. And we'll talk about the concept of depth a little bit later on. And yeah, work doesn't offer us enough experience, and we can get a bit bored. So when we're working on our day jobs, we have set tasks to work on, as I've said, and we need to just get through them. So we need to think up a new source of experience, one that is not our day jobs. We want a source of experience that, is, that allows us to learn and try out new things as much as we want without limits. But more specifically, from this hypothetical new source of experience, we want something that has very little risk, right? We don't want to do the scary stuff. Or if we are doing scary things, we want to do it in such a way that even if we fail, even when we fail, because it will happen, then we don't really lose much. We also want one that has a low investment. So while we want to gain experience, we don't want to spend all the time that we have getting new experience to become better developers, right? Uh, I don't know about everyone else in the room, but I am pretty lazy, and some of my team members will attest to that. So we need something that won't take all of our time, but also we want something that we can drop when other things come up in life, right? Because I can't spend all my time studying to become a better developer. There's other concerns in life. Uh, sometimes you have other... What's the word here? You have, you have other things that need you to attend to them. So some of the older guys here will have kids. I maybe have to walk my cats. I don't walk them. They play on their own. But, but some people have got dogs and all that. And we've got other responsibilities. So we want something that can be stopped and started as life demands. We want something that we can do and give up. And if it fails, we've learned something we don't care. If we need to drop it for now, we can come back to it later. There's no real deadlines, there's no real risk, there's no real pressure. And so I'm going to introduce you to the concept of the side project. <laughs> the side projects are something that I have been working on. <laughs> so I've been working on side projects since I was honestly in high school, and I think it's been something really important to my development and something that's really let me grow a lot. But let me explain a bit what I mean by a side project. Because when I was preparing this talk, somebody meant, asked me, do you mean a side hustle? Should you be making cash on the side? No, that's not what I mean. What I mean by a side project is any programming project or any project really that you work out, that you work on outside of work, right? Just something you build for fun, for yourself, maybe to solve some problem you're having or to work with some tech that you think is cool. And we want it to not be related to work, because if we work too much, then we will burn out. And some of the older developers here in the room might know what I'm talking about. And besides, work can be boring, maybe not for all of us, but it can be. It's not always fun. And we want our side projects to be fun, because we're doing it for fun in our spare time. No one's paying us for it. However, from our side projects, we also want it to be difficult, right? The goal is to learn new things. And uh, we don't learn by doing things that we already know how to do. So if I have to center a div, I promise I know how to do it. Um, I'm not going to learn anything new. We need to challenge ourselves in order to grow. And even if the task turns out to be impossible, we can still learn a lot by uh, trying to solve it. So for example, I've got a Sudoku puzzle on screen that looks impossible. It is technically doable. And what I learned by trying this out for two hours, <clears throat> 20 minutes, <clears throat> I mean uh, 10 minutes, <laughs> was uh, that Google often has a lot of answers for you. And if anybody wants to actually learn how to do this later on, I've got a link for you. You can come find me after the talk. So yeah, the most important thing we want from a side project, however, is that it should be 
something new. We don't want to retread familiar ground. We want to try new things and have those skills grow in us like this lovely plant on screen. Now, at this point, I'm sure some of you are looking at me and saying, I already write code all day. Why should I write more code in my spare time? Like, I do my eight hours, I get my job done. What benefits do I actually get from doing this? And what we get from this is depth. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to explain this now. So parallax is an effect where it is the apparent difference in distance when viewing an object from two different places or from two different perspectives. This effect is what allows vision to gain depth. And this is exactly what makes 3D glasses work. And we can apply this in a bit more of a metaphorical sense, right? So instead of just getting depth on what's on screen, we get depth into what we are working on and the project as a whole. And being able to see that depth and capitalize on it is what really makes us good developers. So let's do a quick example because I've been fluffing about now and let's maybe do something a little bit more in the realm of practicality. There is a problem, a problem that exists on every single team I've ever been on and probably on every team that you guys have ever been on. It's a rather simple problem. It's not a very big one, maybe not even a problem, maybe just an inconvenience. But let's unpack it. So the problem is pretty simple. Everybody wants something slightly different or is working towards something slightly different. So we might have the Scrum Master who just wants your work in and committed by the end of the sprint and he wants it to be deliverable. You might have a UX developer on your team who just wants everything to look good like the design that they've spent hours drawing up. They don't really necessarily care how difficult it might be to implement on the front end. It might not match the data concerns of the back end stuff. They just want it to look pretty. Like they've got those things in their mind, but it's on the back foot, not at the front. The front end developer just wants things to be easy to make, speaking from experience. Uh, and they want things to run quickly and easily and work nicely. And maybe your back end dev just wants things to integrate neatly with the existing systems because otherwise it's a pain to refactor a bunch of already existing stuff. What I'm getting at here is that each member of the team has a different perspective. Each member of the team is looking at the goal of delivering the final product from a slightly different point of view. And while this difference is slight, excuse me, it, makes, it creates friction. And this friction can be a bit of an impediment to productivity. A good team is a team where everybody tries to align and work with each other, and more importantly, has the depth to understand what that means. So some of you guys will have noticed this where you have people who've moved from one role to another. Maybe you have someone who's moved from a dev to being a project manager or a scrum master, and now he knows a bit more about the concerns that everyday devs might face. And this makes them better at their job. So yes, having this depth and being able to see from multiple perspectives allows you to more easily align with your other team members. And once you align properly and everything fits neatly, your team becomes really effective and it is a work of art. And yeah, this was uh, drawn, I mean, traced by yours truly. And hopefully at this point, I've been waffling on a little bit. Hopefully at this point, you guys are thinking what I'm thinking. You're thinking, cool, I wanna start a side project. Uh, and you're like, man, these projects, <laughs> These project, this, this insight stuff sounds incredible. This depth sounds amazing. It's a bit fluffy, but I don't care. I want to work on stuff. Uh, there's probably a single, uh, simple, a single question on your mind now. And that question is simply, how? How do I get started? What do I do? Where do I start? And all of these follow-up questions. And with anything, you start by deciding what it is that you want to work on. And there are two criteria by which I judge this. It's, is it going to be fun? Like I said, a side project must be something that you will enjoy because there's no reason to work on boring stuff in our spare time. And the second question you need to ask is, is it difficult? Is it hard? Will I challenge myself and grow from doing this? And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, then you're good. If, it's, if the answer to one of those questions is yes, you're probably still good, but try and get both. 
And if there's no, then just get a new idea. Go back to the drawing board, find something new. Ideas are a dime a dozen. It's, you'll find something. Ideally, we want something fun and you should look like this while you're coding, right? The best side project is one that will keep us motivated because when you're working on a side project that you've decided on on your own, uh, you don't have the motivating factor of a big chunk of change at the end of the month. So we need it to be something fun or interesting because this isn't work, there's no reason it shouldn't be. The next thing that I want you guys to consider when you're working on a side project is simply what tech you're going to use. Because while we do want something fun, we want to choose our tech stack such that it aligns with both what is good for the project naturally, but also what we want to learn. So let's say I'm a front end dev, I want to learn more back end stuff. I'm not going to focus on making a whole pretty website with React or Angular or Tailwind or whatever that you recently learned about. Instead, I'm going to focus more on the back end stuff. I might not even have a front end, it might just be an API or a command line interface or something like that. And similarly, if you're a back-end dev trying to learn front-end stuff, don't bother setting up database tables and all of that jazz. Just make something pretty. And make sure you choose the right tech, both for you and for the project. And now, when it comes time, you've decided what you want to do, what you want to work on, then you need to actually get started on building it. And this is always the most intimidating part, at least for me, in that, I have this incredible vision of what I want to build. And what I'm actually building is kind of lame. It's broken, it's ugly, it doesn't really work. I want to go from the image on the left to the image on the right. And the answer is, just, is not just draw the rest of the damn owl. Um, you need to, there are ways you can break this down. And what we normally do, and this is standard practice, so I'm sure most of you are familiar, is you start small. You come up with your MVP. In this case, my MVP is these two circles that vaguely give the impression of an owl, maybe if you're squinting. And once you've come up with this MVP, you just continue building on it. So for those of us who don't know what an MVP is, MVP stands for the Minimum Viable Product. And the idea here is that we break whatever we want to build into small pieces, the smallest units that we can, and we choose the smallest idea that we think would be cool or would work or that we can share with people. The next step is simply we figure out how to build it. And that's kind of boring. It involves a lot of Googling, swearing at your screen, and watching YouTube tutorials, at least in my case. And the next thing you do, and this is important, is you share it with other people. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. And you simply repeat this process. So in my case, here of the owl, I might draw the face for it then add the branch, then add maybe some feather details, and so on and so on. You repeat, you repeat, you repeat until you get a refined product. And now I'm going to talk about one of the most important aspects of my entire talk. I want you guys to listen carefully to this part, because this is the central idea that I've learned while building side projects that has made so much sense to me and made me become a better developer. And that is the idea of learning in public. And what this means is as you're building something, as you're learning something new, share it with other people. Do it in a public way so that other people can view your growth. And why is this important? Because sharing things that are broken, that don't work yet, that aren't complete is terrifying. Everybody wants to present their best side to everyone else and showing them the broken, ugly bit, not so great. But the reason this learning in public is super important is because it generates a positive feedback loop. So let's go through this. Initially, when you want to start a side project, you have some kind of inspiration which has led you to decide on this side project. Maybe you think it's cool. Maybe you really want to learn some new tech or whatever. Or maybe you saw somebody else's idea and you're like, I could do that better. Um, inspiration leads you to go put in effort. You put in the effort. You build the thing, you learn how to build it, you put, I wanna say pen to paper, but I guess you put fingers to keyboard and you, uh, you write this thing out. And this effort results in some product that you have. It might not be perfect at this stage, it might not be good, it might not even be functional, but that's okay. What you do then is you share it with people and you don't have to tweet it out on Twitter or on TikTok or whatever you use. 
uh, you can just share it with maybe a couple friends, a couple mentors, and they will give you feedback. And in my experience, the vast, vast majority of feedback you receive in this way is positive. People in general are actually kind of nice and want to see you succeed. And this feedback generates fresh inspiration. Maybe they've given you new ideas that, uh, that you can implement, or maybe they've just given you positive reinforcement. They're like, wow, this is really cool. I can't wait to see the polished version. And this gives you fresh inspiration, which inspires fresh effort, which inspires a fresh product, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And eventually, you just end up with this powerful, powerful loop of just, you build a product, you, people give you feedback, and you build it even better next time. So I've been talking about this in a kind of abstract sense, how you do this, a list of instructions, a list of things you do. Let's talk about a list of things that I did, and let's examine one of my own side projects. And this is a quick weekend project of mine that took me several months to complete. <laughs> um, and the goal when I set out here was one, to work with googly eyes, and two, to, to practice working with and hosting stuff online. Because the previous issue that somebody had given me feedback on was that I would claim that the project works on my machine. It's something we've all been through. And then when you pass it off to someone else, suddenly it doesn't anymore. And that was a problem. It meant that I couldn't easily share my projects and I couldn't get the feedback anymore. So for this one, I was like, let me learn how to do that. Let me set up some hosting. Let me set up some PICD. Let me learn something new, something I've never done before. And let me share it with people widely and far. And so let's jump right into it. I'm going to introduce Googlifier. Googlifier is a brilliant piece of software, possibly the best I've ever written. Uh, even better than the stuff I write for my day job. And all it does is it takes in any arbitrary image, it searches for faces, and it replaces the eyes with googly eyes of the appropriate size. Brilliant stuff, I know. This is going to change the world. <laughs> so let's go through how I built this incredible, amazing project. The first step was simply to choose the idea, right? I, was, I saw some funny picture where somebody had replaced eyes with googly eyes, and I was like, it would be pretty great if I could do that to any image. But I also had no idea how I would do this. At the time that I wrote this, I had only worked with computer vision a little bit and didn't really know how I was going to do the whole thing. I also knew that I wanted this to be something shareable, which meant I needed to build a website and not use Python, which is what I would normally do. So step two, naturally, was choosing the tech. I was like, I need this to be shareable. I need it to work on any device. So the natural choice, of course, is just make a website. Throw up some HTML and, J and JavaScript together, and it'll be good. For my CI CD, I decided to use GitHub Pages, uh, which is a minor feature of GitHub, mostly meant so that you can like, host a quick web page about what your repo is about, and so on. But GitHub Pages comes with inbuilt CI CD rules that you can do to simply deploy whatever is in a certain branch there. And was the easiest CI CD thing that I could find around that would also let me host for free because I am like Scrooge McDuck. I don't want to spend money. <laughs> then step three was the boring part. I had to write the code, which meant I had to actually figure out how to do it. Uh, here's the actual code that runs that adds the Google eyes. It's about 20 lines long. Uh, I didn't have to do the face detection myself, myself, thank goodness. There was somebody who had already written a library. And then the final step, well, not, not the final, final step, but the final step for now was to share it to the public. So you guys have had some experience scanning QR codes. This one won't give you any DVD bucks, but it will lead you to, <laughs> it will lead you to the project, and you can try it out on your own phones. Uh, and if you've got some older phone, or maybe your camera is not clean, or maybe the screen isn't clear, there's a bit.ly link at the bottom there that you can type in manually. And I'm going to give you guys some time now to scan it and maybe play with it if you want. It's going to be on screen for a few more slides, so don't worry if you didn't catch it now. So while everybody is distracted about <laughs> with, uh, adding googly, googly eyes to their, own, uh, to their own selfies, let's move on and talk about how you integrate feedback or how I integrated feedback. So there were a bunch of feedback items I received the first time I shared it. Uh, on the left is the current live version. On the right is the original version. 
So somebody told me that having a plain white background is kind of harsh and burns their eyes. Specifically, what had happened is I sent this to a friend of mine over WhatsApp at around 11.30 p.m. Uh, on a Sunday night. And he opened and he's like, ah, dude, you've burnt my eyes off. Change the color. Uh, some valuable feedback. So now I've made it more of an off-white color. Maybe I'll change it to a dark theme in the future because uh, we know dark theme is superior. Um, the screen wasn't responsive. And so the button would kind of just take up whatever was the full size of your screen. And it might be hard to see on smaller devices or on bigger screens. The text would be really, really small. So I added some CSS to make it scale to different devices and so on and so on. And then I added the option to upload your own image because somebody was like, well, this is cool. I can only do this one random woman. Who is she? Uh, if any of you guys worked with image processing, you've probably seen her before. And yeah, I just made the wording a little bit more descriptive, made it a little bit more fun. And how I decided on these specific ones, because I'm going to talk about some of the other feedback I've gotten in just a moment, is there, because there is an issue where you have a lot of feedback and you just have this mountain of things that people say you should implement, but you might not necessarily have the time to implement, right? Uh, people always want a lot of things from you and you have to prioritize. And when you get this mountain of feedback, which hopefully you will get after sharing, what you do is simply you go back to the concept of the MVP. You're like, OK, which one of these is going to be the quickest, easiest win for me? Or at least this is how I decide on things, because I am uh, I'm very motivated by getting things done quick. Choose the quickest, easiest one, change it, and then do it again. And so when you get a mountain of feedback, just sort it from smallest to biggest and work on that. But let's talk about some things that I'm going to implement in the future, hopefully, if I get time. And here is a list of the things that other people have told me they want. They want a better mobile UX. I'm sure some of you guys have experienced this just now. When you click the button, it doesn't immediately pop up a loading bar. Maybe I could add some better animations. Somebody said, they already look kind of like Polaroid photos. Why don't you add like a glossy feel to it or something? Cool idea. I'm not sure if I'll do it. One person gave me some feedback, which I would never have considered myself, because I'm not really a social media guy. But they're like, why can't I share this image? I don't think you can even copy the image off the screen at the moment. And it had never occurred to me. This person had a different perspective than I did. They had a different point of view. And this gave them like, some good ideas on how I could improve the project. So I'm definitely going to do this one in the future. There's some other things here, like a history of images if you Googleified. One person asked me to add a donate button. I'm like, dude, you, you know me personally. You can just, you can just you know, slip it, <laughs> slip it under my door. Uh, one person had the brilliant idea of shaking the googly eyes when you shake your phone. There is actually an API to do that. Uh, I just haven't figured it out yet. The last person suggested I Googleify videos, which is, which is an example of something that is maybe a bit too big for you to really do in your whatchamacallit for the scope of like a weekend project like this. So that goes right to the end of the priority list. But I was talking about how I might implement these in the future if I got time. And this is a big concern for a lot of us. Because it's all well and good for me to come up on stage and say, you should work on side projects. Here's one I built that's super cool. You should be like me, because I'm awesome. No. Some of you guys have got other things that you need to do. Maybe you don't have that much time in your after, after work is done. And what do you do then? What do you do if you have no time? How do you still manage to work on a side project? And the answer for that is pretty simple. So I'm going to show you my to-do list. Uh, and if you have trouble with making time for working on your side project, it's, the answer is pretty simple. It's just make time. Um, so you don't always have. Like, we make time for a lot of things in life, right? Uh, I make time to help my little sister with her homework. I make time to go to the gym, even though some of you might not believe that one. <laughs> um, I make time to help my mother with watering her plants in the garden. We make time for a lot of things in life. So we can make time to work on our side projects as well, because this is something that will, in the end, help us become better at our jobs. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. Like, you don't have to be like, I'm going to book out a whole weekend, and all I'm going to do for this weekend is work on my side project. No, you can book out time in smaller increments. So maybe just book yourself like 30 minutes at the end of each day or at the start of each day to work on something. Maybe even 15 minutes to just watch a video and try to learn something new. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lot. 
like I said earlier, we want our mini programs to be low. We want our side projects to be, <laughs> I've been thinking about work too much. We want our side projects to be low investment. We want it to be something that isn't causing us additional stress because that's what we want to avoid. So yeah, work on this, on, make time for it. But if you can't, that's okay. You can work on it later. But what if you have the opposite problem? And I somehow had this problem when I was in university where I had too much time. I know it sounds like a lie, but uh, it's true. And because there was a lack of deadlines on my personal projects, they never really went anywhere. There was never pressure. There was always things that needed more that had higher priority. Or, oh. This my mic that just fell. My goodness. Let's get that right back on. So uh, yeah, sometimes you have too much time and you're, there's just no priority for doing your side project. And what you do there is then you simply add some arbitrary date. So for example, for my Googleify project, I might have an arbitrary date of Thursday, the 13th of October, uh, completely arbitrary. And I might say, I need to have this functioning by that day. And what this does is, even if it's not a hard deadline, if it's, even if it's something you can miss, it, it like really puts this project in the back of your mind permanently. You're like, OK, cool. Let me achieve this milestone by this time. And it gives you something to work on. Maybe just, just the right amount of pressure to actually get things done. But what do you do? When you're working on your side project, you've made time for it, you've set deadlines, you have a cool idea, you're working with interesting tech, and you're sharing constantly. But what happens if you miss one of these deadlines or you run into a brick wall out of nowhere? What do you do then? This has happened to all of us, where you've been working on something and suddenly you've done all you can and it just won't work and you don't know what to do next. In this case, there are generally two or so options you can take. And they're pretty simple and they're pretty great. The first one, of course, is simply surpass your limits. Um, <laughs> I know, <laughs> brilliant advice, just do better. But the truth is, every brick wall we see is an opportunity. When we started these side projects, we want to start them so that we can learn something. And we don't grow unless we are challenged. So when you come across a brick wall, bash your head against it. If it doesn't fall down, do it again and again and again and again, till either you get through the brick wall or you end up with head trauma. Uh, <laughs> and if you do end up with head trauma, then it's time for you to do the second option. And that is simply give up, you know? <laughs> Sometimes when you reach a brick wall, there's nothing you can do. Maybe it's for feature, maybe there's reasons beyond your control. Maybe you've learned all you can and to go any further would just cause you undue stress. The goal of side projects is to learn stuff, but also to have fun. So if you're coming up against a brick wall and giving yourself head trauma, you're not having fun anymore and you're not learning anything new. And besides, by this point, you have probably probably learned something you know that you could use even if you didn't finish the whole project and it's just time to take a rest and sometimes after you give up so after you've been working at this for a while and you just take some time to step away you can come back later on with a different perspective and suddenly things will make sense but regardless of what you do whether you have broken through the brick wall and become transcendent and really clever or you've given up and you've embraced Zen, you end up back at zero. You end up back at the start. But this time, you're a little bit wiser, a little smarter. Maybe you know a little bit more stuff, or at least I really hope you do. And what you do now is you're a better developer. So what I want you guys to do now is go out there. I want you to build stuff. I want you to come up with cool, silly ideas Okay, maybe not as silly as adding googly eyes, maybe something a bit more practical. I want you guys to come up with cool ideas. I want you to think of things that would be hard. I want you to choose good tech. I want you to build stuff, and I want you to share them. Share it with each other. Share it with your mentors. Share it with me. I love looking at people's projects. But mostly, I want you guys to go out, work on side projects, and become better developers.
Uh, we're a bit ahead of time now. So if you guys have got questions, that would be great because I've just wrapped up my talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. So, any questions? If you have a question, please come to the mic at the front. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if you're a bit too shy, you can shout it out to me and I'll repeat the question just so that everybody in the room and online can hear. So yeah, Tim, you can go first. Cool, so I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, the question is, why does it not work on cats? <laughs> um, so you're not going to believe me, but I was actually looking at that earlier this week in the run-up to this talk, because initially I wanted to have a picture of one of my cats there. And the reason it doesn't work on cats is because I tried to use a really small facial recognition library, and it was trained for humans. Uh, if, you, if you know any that are trained for cats, or if you'd like to help me build one, that would be great. I've seen one. Oh, okay. We'll talk later. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, I might just be projecting here, but I don't have a problem with starting projects. I have a problem with everything after that. <laughs> so you, oh, okay. Uh, no, I, I've got the exact same thing. Don't go look up my GitHub. You'll find a million unfinished projects. So what so my I... my question is, do you have any suggestions for that, Joe? Mm, yeah, I, mean, uh, I do. Uh, I'm not sure how practical they are, but like I said earlier, with the setting deadlines for yourself, then you get this kind of, you have a mild amount of pressure to resolve things by then. But this is also where the concept of sharing comes back into it, right? When you share with other people, there's a bit of a social contract there of you will share with them again in the future. If I share something with you, for example, Temba, you're going to come to me in another week or two and be like, so how's that thing going? Um, and I'll be like, oh, shit, now I do actually have to put work into it. And that kind of, that sharing it with other people and setting deadlines and sharing those deadlines with other people also helps. It kind of, it lights a fire under you that, let, that makes sure you actually get things done. So yeah, I hope that answered the question. Any other questions? Done once, done twice. All right, cool. Then I think we can end for now a little bit early and you guys can go out and get snacks and stuff. But also, uh, before you go, I'm going to be like Oprah right now, and I want you guys to look under your chairs. Some of you <laughs> might have some DVD box codes under there. Uh, most of you won't. Uh, but, but for the lucky ones who did get DVD box, uh, just remember they are transferable. So remember who gave them to you. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, everybody.